welcome everyone to the oh, hi Judith um, to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning uh, for part three of the three dimensions of Eco Dharma series with Lobsang Tempa. And today we'll be exploring the service oriented domain of engaged environmental protection. Michael Lobsang Tempa is a Tibetan Buddhist translator, meditation instructor, cultivating emotional balance teacher, eco dharma student, and a former Buddhist monastic. And he is coming to us from London and he's currently at the Contemplative Consciousness Network there. And he has lots of other stuff that he does. So check out his website and the organization and check out ours. We are Donna based. I will uh, drop um, some links in the chat that can lead you to our website where you can donate via Venmo, PayPal, credit card, um, and all that good stuff. And I think that's about it. I'll turn this over to Tempa. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you so much, Tempa. Thank you for making time for this. Um, I really enjoyed the last one on the multiplicity of beings. I thought that one was really awesome and looking forward to this one. So thank you. And yeah, okay, over to you. Thank, yeah, thank you so much, Gage, for the introduction. And of course, deep bows of gratitude to the San Francisco Dharma Collective for having me. It's always a huge honor ever since my first visit in 2019. Uh, the invitation of Noam and Eve Ekman, and um, I've had a, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet so many Dharma friends there, and um, I'm just glad and happy that this connection is still fully functional, and uh, hoping that we can indeed together generate some waves of peace, love, and wisdom that would resound throughout the world, and in addition to other things, those waves can be probably quite powerfully applied in the domain of ecology and environmentalism, because uh, quite obviously what we're witnessing with regards to uh, climate and um, its weird alterations this summer uh, can be quite alarming to uh, many people. Um, continental Europe right now is experiencing a heat wave. Uh, people are suffering quite strongly. Um, some of my friends, um, my relatives from Mexico went to visit Madrid and um, contrary to their expectations, Madrid had incredible heat, uh, whereas Mexico itself was much cooler at that period in time. So everything, of course, seems quite out of balance. And balance is one of the key words for our work with regards to ecodharma. And of course, another quintessential word that we have talked about in the first installment in this series is inspiration. Because unless we feel inspired, unless we feel a certain level of inner resources that would allow us to do the work that's necessary to do, whether with regards to our inner well-being or communal well-being or global well-being, we would just simply not get that work done. So in order to receive the inspiration, we often in the Tibetan tradition do practices related to the inspire, inspiring power or inspiring transformative blessings of those who have come before us. And some people understand that as being merely metaphorical. We're just simply think thinking of something that's inspiring. Some people like to consider that more with regards to actual transmission happening in a way. And uh, the great living yogi Garchin Rinpoche, who's based in Arizona, but before that spent many years in concentration camp in Tibet and has done incredible amounts of practice and teaching always says that the actual meaning of blessings or that inspiring energy is love. We open ourselves to profound types of love. We allow that love to flow into our being and that transforms us from the inside and allows us to do the transformational work, whether on the outer level or on the inner level. So to begin our session together, I would invite all of us to once again do the practice of connecting to the three lineages and that will be a guided meditation. So if you feel like meditating right now, please find a comfortable stationary position that would allow you to go into the states of relaxation, stability, and clarity. Of course, since it's more of a contemplative or analytical meditation in a way, we will not be necessarily visualizing anything. This practice can be done 
while sitting up. This practice can be done while being in the supine position, just lying comfortably on your back if that's more comfortable. Anything is in between is also absolutely possible. So the first thing to do is just to check in with our body, see what might feel most stable, most comfortable, most appropriate right now. And then once we have adjusted the different parts and elements of our body, the invitation is to bring our awareness to the tactile sensations and to spend some time observing those as they arise, change, and disappear in the tactile field, the energetic field of the body. Noticing the experiences of our body being in contact with the ground, the tactile sensations in those areas. And gently checking whether there's any particular tension there that we can let go of and release. so that our body enters a dynamic equilibrium of relaxation, stability, and vigilance. An equilibrium that is not unlike the equilibrium of the earth itself, both stable and constantly transforming. In addition to the solidity of our body, just like with the earth itself, there is a circulation of heat that we might notice within this field. There is a circulation of liquids, most obviously felt perhaps through the saliva in our mouth, but extending way beyond that. And there is a circulation of air and gases. There's that movement accompanying our breath. And for a little while, to settle our mind in its natural state, we can observe this process of breathing through the tactile sensations that accompany it. Allowing the inherent wisdom of the body to choose the optimal rhythm, pace, and volume of breathing with each new cycle, without much intervention from our side.
And then with our body resting in this equilibrium, we can take a few moments to recall the aspirations that brought us here today. What is it that I want to realize, fulfill? make true at the intersection of my own well-being, communal well-being of humanity, and then the global well-being of the planet itself with all of its fragile systems. What are my personal interests and aspirations in this domain. And then Having established those, we can take a few moments to also generate the wish to fully uncover our beautiful potential so that we might indeed serve the well-being of multiple beings, the well-being of all who live. If I truly want to be of benefit, I need to gain and find and access all the resources all the types of energy, all the abilities, all the talents, all the positive qualities. But in order to flourish in this manner, to uncover my full potential, I will need the inspiration. I will need to stay inspired to keep inspiring myself by reconnecting to the powerful sources of inspiration on the path. And this is where I can powerfully connect to the three lineages. The first lineage is that of land holders. And that's related to the land that we are currently finding ourselves on. This land has been inhabited by multiple generations of people, different groups of people, different ethnic groups different tribes, all the way back to the first humans who came here. And although not all of these humans have been passionate about preserving this land, some were truly taking care of it or trying to take care of it, respecting its energy. And beyond that, to go beyond the scope of anthropocentricity, our human-centered views, there were numerous other sentient beings inhabiting this land. And most of them were living in perfect harmony with the natural world. So may I learn from them. May their inspiration, their inspiring force flow into my heart. The second lineage is the spiritual lineage or multiple lineages that we align ourselves with the lineage or the lineages of transmission of spiritual teachings 
different types of dharma. Spiritual practices and teachings that we ourselves find some affinity with. We can think of the inspiring examples of wisdom, compassion, love, patience, and so forth within the traditions that we personally have a connection to. We can think of our immediate teachers. We can think of the great teachers of the past. And we can invite, we can invite their inspiring force to similarly flow into our heart. And finally, for the third lineage, we can think of our ancestry, the blood and bone ancestry that produced this very body that we currently use as our vessel in this world. Multiple generations of ancestors, some of their choices we cannot accept as being the most ethical, wise, or compassionate. But one thing we know is that they've displayed powerful levels of resilience. They had to cooperate. They had to be inventive. They had to be resourceful. They had to establish powerful bonds based on love and trust. So all of those skills and qualities flow in our veins, live in ourselves as well. And we now have an opportunity to use that material for something greater. So may this inspiring force flow into our heart as well. And then we'll orient it towards the greater well-being for all who live and for the planet. And then as we approach the end of this brief meditation, for the last part of it, we can use a simple act of cognitive intelligence, intelligence in the domain of desires, wishes, and aspirations, by generating a powerful wish with regards to our role in the world. And it can be something very simple and deeply personal. For example, thinking, may I always contribute to the healing of the world? Or may I always bring greater harmony to the world? Or may I always benefit all who live? And as we breathe naturally, and as we hold this aspiration in our mind, we can strengthen it, breathing life into it and increasing its potency so that from a certain point in our life, it starts automatically guiding us in each situation. Manifesting greater degrees of healing, harmony, and benefit for all.
Then we bring our attention back to the body for a little while. We notice the sensations, and if we wish, we can introduce a tiny bit of movement by rocking back and forth, moving our fingers, moving our toes, bringing our attention back to the space around us and to our shared online space, and gradually concluding this preliminary meditation. Thank you. And just as a anthropological or cultural note on that, originally within the Indo-Tibetan tradition of practice, most sessions of meditation, especially tantric meditation related to meditational deities, where we would be meditating on the image of Tara or the form of Avalokiteshvara, practices in which we would be reciting mantras and so forth, but also the types of practice where we would be analytically investigating the nature of reality or the nature of self or simply cultivating concentration. All of those sessions would traditionally, uh, in old Tibet, uh, pre-occupation um, Tibet, be preceded by powerful prayers to the lineage of transmission. And because each practice comes from a specific lineage of transmission, um, these prayers would start by invoking the inviting, inspiring presence of the Buddha, the historical Buddha, and so forth, and then go through a sequence of very specific lineage masters, male and female, who contributed to uh, our ability to do these practices. And because we're contemplating their inspiring example, because we're trying to connect to their uh, energy of mindfulness, their energy of awakening, their energy of compassion deeply in our heart, uh, there would be a certain alchemical process happening, presumably. And of course, uh, although from my side, I'm fully convinced of the incredible power of this approach, this is something that uh, we can investigate for ourselves. But one thing that happened was that when these practices were being transmitted to the quote-unquote West, uh, when these practices were first being introduced to continental Europe to the United States and so forth. There was a long period when these lineage prayers uh, were being omitted simply because people did not really know who any of these lineage masters were, especially from the Tibetan period um, in the transmission. The Indian masters were more or less known uh, because of their contribution to the field of philosophy, because of their text, and because they're actually there's less of them than there is Tibetan masters. That period of history was just shorter uh, by comparison. Because of that, this practice was somewhat omitted for a few decades, and now it's coming back, in my observation, to many uh, Tibetan Buddhist communities. Some have always used it, some have omitted it for, for some time and is now coming back to it because there's a greater amount of resources available, but also because there's now a greater understanding of the importance of avoiding colonialism in our attitude to the Buddhist Dharma in particular, but also to the Hindu Dharma and so forth. And uh, avoiding colonialism uh, is partly done through recognizing the incredible contribution of those who have come before us and not assuming that we necessarily know everything better not assuming that just through three days of reading books on mindfulness, we'll already understand the essence of Buddhism to a greater degree than these practitioners who have spent 80 years of their life practicing, some of them spending 20, 30 years in retreat, in solitary retreat, applying these teachings in meditation and so forth. So it's a very interesting uh, connection there. And of course, when we extend that, and that's uh, sort of more of a modern application of that, when we extend that to the domain of lend our uh, caregiving and our blood and bone ancestry this is also where we are invited to take um, the approach of the beginner's mind in a way because for many of us we are on unceded land uh, that used to uh, that was originally cared for uh, by uh, indigenous cultures uh, and uh, we are now being uh, simply uh, uninvited guests there. And although that's a painful realization to come to, 
uh, it does inspire a certain level of open humility, uh, a certain respectful humility, compassionate humility, compassionate openness. We can describe it in different ways depending on what feels most inspiring to us. And the same thing actually with the blood and bone ancestry as well. It is in no way an invitation to consider all the actions of our ancestors good, uh, ethical, and so forth. But we also understand that things are contextual. They did what they thought was best. That does not mean we need to agree with it or in any way replicate what they did. But there are some positive qualities that we do need to recognize and then invite into our heart. Otherwise, we would be cut off from uh, the source of inspiration. And because of that, we might suffer certain problematic types of thinking from certain problematic types of attitude towards ourselves and our own culture. And this is actually powerfully happening in the parts of the world, especially in Asia, where they are, where there are uh, Christian missionaries coming and telling people that their entire culture that existed prior to the 20th century, for example, the old Buddhist and shamanist traditions of Mongolia, that's all old styled, old fashioned, useless, uneducated, and so forth. So the only way to go into the 21st century and, and truly be successful in business and life and relationships, the only way to truly become a part of the global world is by converting and rejecting that uh, ancestral heritage. And uh, oftentimes these uh, the sentiments are accompanied by um, monetary offering. So people are being paid to convert to Christianity. And uh, that is a very difficult psychological thing to deal with. If you're someone is trying to convince you that the entirety of the ancestry is completely garbage and you need to reject that. Otherwise, you're not truly a member of the global modern society. So that's something that we play around with or we can play around with, and not simply in meditation, because this is also, in a way, an invitation to do some journaling by considering, well, what are the good qualities that I can recognize in people who were, and in people who are taking care of this land? And of course, what are the systems of harmony and balance that I can notice in the land that I'm, being, that I'm occupying? Because once we go beyond the human circles, we see that there are or there were prior to our active human intervention, um, there were incredibly balanced systems related to the natural world, to the world of plants and animals, um, and bugs and bacteria and fungi and so forth. And within that, we can find incredibly innovative solutions, systemic solutions with regards to how things might be organized. Similarly, with uh, uh, journaling, we can think about what are the insp wonderful inspiring qualities of my dharmic lineage, my spiritual lineage, that would be especially applicable to the domain of ecodharma. What qualities can I bring in from the domain of those spiritual teachings to the environmental uh, domain? And uh, this is something that we will actually discuss today. I will just give a few examples from the Buddhist tradition that we might bring into our environmental activism. Uh, or simply our environmental, our attempts to educate ourselves in the environmental domain. And finally, what are the inspiring qualities of my blood and bone ancestry? And that starts with our parents, grandparents, and so forth. So the people we might have interacted with directly, or our caregivers, uh, not necessarily simply our blood ancestors, because there's also a um, community transmission that has nothing to do with genes or DNA. Uh, per se. But beyond that, the previous generations, the uh, sort of the ethnic groups that we belong to in a way or that we're connected to in some ways, what did they have? Uh, what qualities or did they have? What challenges did they overcome? Um, and what types of resilience did they display that we can now bring into the challenges that we're facing every day right now as a species? Uh, or as a community inhabiting a specific piece of land. So there's all that. And uh, I'll just activate my slides once again, uh, just as a technical reminder, if you're following this class on a, a computer version of Zoom, 
uh, you can either have me and other people in the corner or you can split the screen between the slides and the participants and you can toggle uh, the dividing line. You can move it back and forth to make the slides larger, to make the slides smaller and so forth. I don't think that's quite an option if you're using a mobile device, but let's just hope that you will have a comfortable way of seeing the slides and also seeing other participants or me if you want to see us, which is not um, a strict necessity, of course. Uh, as always, I am very much humbled by talking about this, and I can only uh, and want to uh, reinforce that I'm only presenting this as a fellow student. I'm not a capital T teacher, for sure, not a teacher of any kind, really, but simply a practitioner who's found some benefit in all of this and has received a lot of different teachings on Ikudharma from my Tibetan masters, from my Western teachers, uh, or Western quote unquote uh, teacher, uh, quote, quote unquote Western teachers, because they're actually from all over the world, uh, but they are a part of the globalized world uh, and are first generation practitioners, as opposed to my Himalayan teachers who come from multiple generations of uh, Buddhist teaching and practice. I just have received a lot of these different tips, ideas, recommendations. Uh, philosophical explanations on all of this and try to compile it all into one form that might be to a certain degree beneficial, but there are a billion other forms that we could use to talk about e ecodharma. And I will reference some wonderful sources to explore uh, and to read and to contemplate and to practice with a little bit later on. So in our previous meetings, we have discussed the personal domain of ecodharma and uh, to revi revisit that very briefly, this is where we can talk about our personal well-being, our psychological well-being, our mental health, our emotional hygiene, and so forth, with regards to how all of that can be supported by our contact with nature. And this is, of course, where we find a lot of information and a lot of research these days on what's called eco-psychology. That's not a new term at all. Some people know that uh, uh, there are even master's programs on uh, eco-psychology offered in the United States, but it's basically an investigation of the role that nature in general can play in our well-being. And even though initially it might seem like we are prioritizing ourselves over nature, which already implies a certain degree of anthropocentricity, if not uh, complete selfishness on our behalf, uh, the progression from personal to global uh, is actually an important part of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It's simply a practical approach where we first work on something that's relatively small and at the same time something that needs to be transformed so that we are of benefit to the world. So we start with the small scope of responsibility, as it's called in the Tibetan tradition, and we work on our behavior and on our thinking in this very life. That's the starting point. So before I become a major source of well-being for the world, become, before I am able to offer service to multiple beings, to benefit multiple beings, I need to do some work on this very person sitting here, with regards to my body, to my mind, my emotional energy, my habits, uh, the different types of behavior that I display. And I would ideally establish a certain degree of resilience because that's needed for any other stage in the path. And I would also establish a certain level of conscious nonviolence practice. I would start by consciously avoiding different types of harmful behavior. Yes, I will not become perfect overnight or even over the course of multiple years perhaps, but I will be truly aspiring uh, to that goal, and I will be rededicating myself to the goal again and again and again. And nature can already support me in all of that. I can indeed receive a major uh, inflow of inspiration. I can receive a powerful, um, I even can receive powerful support through simply by being with the natural world. That's a fact. Uh, that has been established through uh, research, and that's a fact that I can experiment with on my own. 
And there's a lot of then uh, uh, more detailed discussion on how specific types of mental problems, specific types of inner imbalances can be regulated by establishing contact with specific types of natural environments uh, or with the five elements. So in the Tibetan medical tradition and in the Tibetan Indo-Tibetan meditative tradition, there is a description, of course, of our body and its health. That's part of the Tibetan medical tradition. And also of how our mind is also a balance of qualities associated with the five elements. And if we're finding ourselves lacking in a specific department, we can receive the lacking points, the lacking types of energy through, for example, connecting more to this element or to that element. So to give an example, and the element of fire, one of the elements building blocks for reality itself, which is just heat uh, and coldness. If the element of fire in terms of our psychology is associated with a quality of passion, being truly passionate about something, and we're noticing ourselves really lacking that, one of the types of practice that would be recommended is to go out into the natural world, uh, of course, taking the necessary types of precaution by using sunscreen and so forth, but go out into the natural world and be somewhere where we can powerfully receive that energy of fire, connect to the element of fire, either by being under the sun or if that's available to us by being next to volcanoes or just sing, sitting next to a fire um, that we started, but that represents that energy as well. And through that, allow our inner passion to be reignited. And then similarly, the quality of earth is to bring stability. The quality of water psychologically is to bring comfort, but also adaptability. The quality of air is to bring movement, including intellectual movement, ability to arrive at intellectually valid solutions for problems. And the quality of space, which is the fifth element in the Tibetan system, is to give space to everything, for us to have space for everything in our life. So if we're feeling that our life is too clogged, and there's too, too clattered, too full of stuff, and we don't really have the space to do this and that and to attend to this person and to do this kind of work. If we're feeling that our life is too full, we need to reconnect to the element of space. And of course, as some people who have studied nature of the mind practices in the Tibetan tradition would know, there's a lot of that in Tibetan Buddhism, sitting out on a hill and looking out at an open vista and allowing that openness, that spaciousness to flow into our mind so that we recognize, oh, I actually can do all of these things in one day, or I can space them out elegantly and intelligently. And so our job is constantly to balance the five elements so that the inner level is full of resources that we can then offer to wider circles. And we talked about the communal type of well-being or the so-called spiritual ecology, which in the traditional teachings invites us to consider the multiplicity of beings around us. Uh, but on a simpler level, we're also thinking about our human communities, and this is where we see them also as ecosystems of their own, and we think, well, I am a part of this system, or I am a part of all of these systems, what can I offer to them? How can I contribute to their greater health? How can I contribute to the wholesomeness of these systems? And this is, of course, an invitation a perpetual invitation. We always need to think of that when we realize and we re, when we remi remember that we are part of these human-made communities. We are a part of this specific culture, that specific culture, this specific ge geography-based community, that specific political community. We're a part of this spiritual community here or this identity-based community there, and we're making our contributions all the time. As uh, Sylvia Burstein once said, and of course many people from the Bay would know her as one of the founding teachers of the Spirit Rock community, we are, that's a quote that I really like, it's from one of her talks, we are vibe machines. So we're constantly generating a certain vibe, and that vibe is being spilled out into the world. It's constantly being spilled out 
It's being pumped into all the systems to which we belong, human systems and non-human systems, because from this more traditional but very important uh, Buddhist view, our vibe is not simply affecting other humans. It's affecting animals, it's affecting other types of life, and also within the Buddhist traditional view, it's affecting the invisible beings all around us. And of course, that's also an idea that is shared by indigenous cultures as well, many of them. So what is that vibe? And how can I adjust that vibe so that it's truly beneficial? This is where we connect to, for example, the powerful teachings within the Buddhist tradition and the uh, yoga tradition uh, coming from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And this is where it connects, for example, to the teaching on the four immeasurables, um, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And we can receive incredibly detailed instructions on how to cultivate these four so that our vibe is the vibe of loving kindness, compassion, etc. So that that's the thing that we're feeding to the world. But beyond that, because the four measurables are never enough on their own, they always need to be balanced by wisdom. They always need to be combined with wisdom to especially have the liberating power. We also think, well, how can I establish greater levels of wisdom? And once again, to give another quote from Sylvia Burstein, wisdom in the Buddhist tradition can be defined simply as exceptional levels of common sense with regards to causality, with regards to uh, the world around us with regards to uh, ourself and our habits and many other things. So that's something to consider. How can we contribute wisdom to the world and cultivate that wisdom? And so this is where we start the conversation about the global plane, the global level of investigation. We consider now this more general system that we belong to that goes beyond all of these communities and includes the inflow, the transformation of the dynamics of, for example, the climate system of the world. And um, uh, just to go through the slides, uh, we've done the meditation on connecting to the three lineages. This is where we can very comfortably apply the very first teaching of the historical Buddha, the teaching about the four noble truths, which, as many people would remember, is a system of two results and two causes. So there are four statements there. The first and the third statements are results. They're related to specific results. The second and the fourth statements are about the causes of those results. So and the Buddha talks about how our life is accompanied by troubling experiences or dukkha. Then uh, he describes the causes of those troubling experiences. He then, he then says that there is a potential cessation for these troubling experiences. They can be eliminated, potentially, somehow. And then he suggests a path that might, if applied properly, lead to that cessation. And uh, the invitation from his side there is for us to consider all of that carefully to discern the troubling experiences in our own life, to then accurately discern and recognize the causes of those troubling experiences so that we can let them go, then to reach the cessation by following the suggested path, by combining all the elements of the path in a skillful manner, and uh, once they're all gathered and brought to full fruition, the idea there is that that will in turn lead to the final result of the necessary cessation. So with that, we are also absolutely free to, without any problem whatsoever, apply the same logic or the same system of analysis to any problem that we might be facing. And indeed, Vietnamese master Thich Nhat Hanh, for example, once co-authored a book on a healthy lifestyle and um, dietary habits in which he and his co-author applied, applied the same logic to, for example, the problem of obesity uh, for people who want to look at their own health conditions through the lens of the same logical analysis. 
So the same logic then by extension can be applied to the global level of environmental problems. And this is of course where we, some of us might have slightly different or very different opinions about the matter because there are different conclusions that people come to depending on which sources they rely on in terms of how bad is it and what's exactly going on. But there is probably one common denominator there for all of us, and that is even for people who don't quite yet accept the idea of climate change and specifically global boiling, as it was uh, just a few days ago referred to by uh, the Secretary General of the UN, probably all of us would still agree that there's quite an incredible level of pollution all around us, that finding microplastics in humans and animals and actually pretty much everywhere these days, that's a problem. That's not something desirable. We probably don't want microplastics inside our bodies. We probably don't want to be drowning in garbage. We probably want to observe beautiful natural vistas and not piles of trash all over. We probably want to breathe fresh air. We probably want to drink fresh water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at least some level of commonality is there. And then once we start considering that level, we can say, okay, that's the level of the troubling experiences that we are dealing with. At least we can say an incredible level of pollution, but beyond that, of course, for many of us, yes, indeed, climate change, global boiling, incredibly strange things happening to the climate patterns that we can observe with our own eyes. I have that experience from visiting Nepal over many years, uh, a friend of mine has recently talked about how incredibly the climate has changed in Northern California over the last 30 years and so forth. It's just within the very recent history, we can think of that. But then we think, okay, at least at the level of just pollution, too much pollution, let's say that. Where does it come from? What's the cause of these troubling experiences? And this is where we can then do proper analysis of the second step uh, by identifying three uh, levels, let's say. So this is just thinking out loud in a way. This is an analytical meditation that I am in a way speaking out loud into existence, but that we can undertake on our own. And then we might indeed uh, identify slightly different factors or divide these three into a greater and into a larger list or essentialize them, quintessentialize them back into one or two, perfectly fine. It's our analysis, but what's important is that we do it. But uh, as an example, we could identify three. Uh, first thing we can think about is the observ observable results and predictable trends, right? Uh, with regards to uh, what is it that we are calling this type of suffering. So we can uh, call, uh, look at the extreme climate conditions and the climate catastrophes and the heat waves and the forest fires and the amount of forest that has been destroyed by fires in the last few years and so forth. Ecological catastrophes, for example, oil spills that are happening alarmingly frequently um, and so forth, accumulation of microplastics in human bodies and so forth. So, okay, at least there's all of that. Or if we, if we don't necessarily want to focus on some of these, others would probably still be valid for us. Even if we don't like to think about extreme climate conditions, and many people try to avoid that topic for whatever reason, including climate anxiety or simply unwillingness to accept this updated view of the world as shifting in very unpleasant ways at a very fast pace. Okay, let's focus on, I don't know, microplastics in our blood. That's, that's, that's a problem big enough already. And then we think, okay, what, what is it coming from? There's group activity of humanity. Microplastics were not brought to our blood, blood by tigers or monkeys or birds or aliens or spirits or Santa Claus or God. These are not the beings that are responsible for microplastics and pollution. Who is responsible? Humans. But we can't simply say humans and then stop with that or just kill all of humans. 
or I don't know, transport all of humans to the moon or to Mars or something else. Those, those options are not really available, not really compassionate, not, not really viable in any way. So what we can do is think, okay, there are specific patterns of human behavior, quite frankly related to unchecked capitalism, quite frankly related to colonialism and uh, the dumping of garbage from the global north to the global south and so forth. But there are patterns of behavior, economic behavior, but also individual behavior, because there are indeed individuals making those choices, quite often CEOs uh, or boards of specific organizations that simply at some point decide, oh, we don't care. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what's going to happen in 100 years, as long as I get my short-term short, short, short term, term profit. We're seeing, uh, quite interestingly, a similar mindset in the people who are refusing to meet the demands of the writers and actors who are currently on strike uh, in many places, including Los Angeles, right? The decision makers in those hyper-rich corporations saying, oh, we don't care. No, we're going to do what's most profitable. We don't care about you as individuals. We don't care about your demands. Uh, surprisingly, similar states of mind might be at the root of that. So we're thinking about group activity of humanity largely accomplished through the activity of mega corporations and governments as well as individual actions of people. And individual actions of people here can denote people in positions of power people who are not in high positions of power, but who are complying with what they think is just the path of least resistance for their specific job, for example, uh, or because of receiving bribes and so forth and making it easier for uh, bad decisions to be made. And then at the bottom of the, uh, that sort of list are us as individuals who are making on each day the choice to recycle or not recycle, to save the water or not save the water, to turn off the light or not turn off the light, and so, so forth. We are often, this bottom level, grassroots level, uh, users portrayed as the main problem. So it's sometimes, as people know, describe that, oh, it's your choice about straws, plastic straws, or it's your choice to do this or that. That is very important. And it is indeed very important because everything is very important. But in terms of this analysis of what's making the greatest contrib contribution, it's not the straws, it's the activity of the mega corporations. The straws are still an important ethical choice, but we need to assign a responsibility appropriately. That's part of the analysis. You don't have to believe in anything I'm saying at all. But just to do that, who is bearing the greatest responsibility and who needs to be pressured most urgently to change so that there's some sustainability available to us. But then beyond that, that's very important for the Dharma element of eco-dharma because everything up to this point is simply environmentalism, environmental thinking, systems thinking, systems thinking as applied to environmentalism and so forth. Just good logic and this is something that I only have a basic understanding of, as opposed to professionals uh, who have been working with this domain for many years. And of course, there are people at the intersection of Dharma and environmentalism, including Rebecca Solnit, for example, who has just published a book this year on climate change and how there is still a certain degree of hope, but uh, there's also things and patterns to identify and incredible amount of things to do and so forth. So obviously there are people who have much greater understanding of this than me, but for quote unquote Dharma workers or people who work with the Dharma and that's something that I have a connection to through being a Tibetologist and a Buddhist translator, the third point here is of special importance and interest. And that's the underlying mental um, and um, social patterns. So we have certain patterns in legislation, and those can be changed through applied pressure. And we would see that, of course, if we look across the world, there are countries and places where that applied pressure is available more easily. Uh, for example, places like Costa Rica, Northern Europe, these uh, regions and these countries are trying to make a lot of effort 
Uh, and of course, they're not perfect in any way. There's no place, no country that's perfect. There's no government that's perfect. Not at all. Um, the conscientious citizens of the world need to always apply pressure to their governments, regardless of how good that government appears to be for the time being. Because to quote Sherwood Smith, who I really love for her princess books, books about princesses saving themselves and the day, a good ruler needs to keep proving themselves, otherwise they turn into a dictator. Very simple logic that uh, is very applicable here in the domain of governance and legislation. Then there's culture. That's a very important thing that we all affect in terms of what we post on social media, what we consume, what we read, what we transmit to our children, the books we buy, therefore incentivizing publishers to prioritize something in terms of publishing. As someone who has published some books in the Russian-speaking world, that's a very simple logic. If people don't buy the book, most publishers are simply not incentivized to keep pushing the good content. They're not, because they are work within the market, most publishers, there are exceptions, but most publishing houses are incentivized to publish what sells. So if we're not buying the good books, even if we are grateful for their existence, it's going to be less good books published. It's a very sad and simple logic, but it's a logic that we can really affect. It's a thing that we can really make a contribution. Even at the level of finances that we currently have available to us, we do have certain wiggle room there, simply in terms of buying a book, giving it to, as a gift to a friend, buying a book, reading it. Therefore, integrating that new cultural information into our cultural field, our personal field of culture, and then expanding it, extending it to the culture field of our family, making our family has the same culture with regards to environmental issues. Our friend group has the same culture with regards to environmental issues and Dharma related issues as well. And this is not about being preachy, but it's about being diplomatic and skillful. Because, of course, if we're constantly angry and we're waving a book, and people we're saying, how dare you not read this? Well, they're going to become even more reluctant and will start talking to us and will consider us slightly crazy and yada, yada, yada. We'll know how it all goes. But if we're skillful, if we're seductive with our cultural influence, then it becomes available. And this is actually where the Tibetan tradition once again has some interesting things to offer because it talks about uh, four types of enlightening activity that realized beings apply to this world. Uh, and as we're progressing on the path, we need to gradually cultivate all those four types of activity. The first, first type of activity is pacifying. So that's our ability to soothe, to pacify problems, to heal, to remove the pain of beings, to remove the war, to remove the suffering, to remove the fears, to talk to someone so that they feel more at ease. That's pacifying. Quite obviously, we already have a certain level of that available to us because we can talk to people and help them calm down. We can observe the breath and make our own body and mind calm down. We can, in small ways, alleviate the suffering of beings and our abilities with that gradually get extended through practice and through training. Then there's the multiplying activity where, or the expanding activity in which we multiply the resources, the different types of resources, so that there is abundance and prosperity in the world. And that's a very important idea as well. There's never, um, no one in the, in, at least in the Indo-Tibetan tradition ever says that we need to suffer from poverty and lack of resources and have only bad things available to us and so forth. Not at all. There's a lot of practices specifically for invoking that inner sense of being prosperous, abundant, flourishing. Everything is lush and amazing and brilliant and so forth. And these are the words that are used in such practices. So it's both the outer activity to establish all that and the inner activity of having that state of mind of feeling that our personal bubble of experiences is indeed rich in all the good ways. It's rich with compassion. It's full, uh, it's full of wisdom. It's full of positive human connections. It's full of love that flows between us and other beings. There's a certain, also a number of good things to enjoy, including good food and good companionship and a nice cup of tea, a nice cup of coffee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are incredible 
uh, practices on this theme that were composed by masters as early as 1500 years ago. And um, that's an important part of our activity. But then for this cultural thing comes the, mag um, the magnetizing or the controlling activity. And that's basically being seductive in a productive manner, being seductive with how we speak, with what we convey, with how we edit our TikTok videos, if that's what we do and so forth. So as to attract beings skillfully and with a good motivation to the qualities of wisdom and compassion, to the qualities of environmental responsibility and everything that comes with it. And that's something to consider as well. Well, how can I undertake or contribute to this cultural transformation through what I've mentioned before, through pacification, through multiplying, and through the seductive uh, power as well. And then the fourth fourth uh, activity, which is the hardest to truly control and master, is the destroying activity, uh, the activity, or sometimes it's called wrathful, and it's basically about dismantling or destroying systems that are problematic, the dismantling systems of oppression, and so forth. But on a simple level, that's also available to us in terms of letting go of the habits that are not really serving our well-being and the well-being of others. If we simply do that, that's already our first step towards mastering that activity as well. So we can think, oh, what is it that from my list of habits, what is it that I can let go so that there is a greater degree of well-being for myself and the world in the environmental domain in this case? And then over time, when we're together with others, we can think, well, what are the social systems and governance systems that can be eliminated because they're no longer serving the world? And this is where we can start thinking about, for example, gradually letting go of carbon-based energy and moving on to uh, the renewable sources of energy, for instance. But there are many, many other things of that nature that we can identify on our own. This is not me saying, oh, it has to be this, it has to be that. I'm simply a student of Ikudharma as well, but this is where we can do that analysis together with our groups of people, together with our communities, whether that's our family or just us and our partner or just us and a group of friends or just us and our book club, but then going beyond that to greater, greater circles. And then finally, that's what's important for the Dharma. There are thinking feeling and identity systems. So what do we think? Repetitive patterns of thinking. What do we feel within our emotional body as Tsokhna Rinpoche uh, describes it? And what do we identify as? These are our identity systems. And that's one of the things that I uh, work with a lot as a facilitator. Our identity systems, meaning our um, role-based identities or our stable identities, which uh, include our gender expression, our sexual orientation, our ethnic uh, group, uh, the group the ethnic connections that we have, our jobs and so forth, our professional experience, our age group, all of that, our roles, the roles that we play in the world and that we express or that we practice uh, as queer theory would describe it. And then um, at the same time, our qu quality related identity system. So how do we see ourselves as an individual and how do we once again practice being this individual? Are we compassionate? Do we see ourselves as compassionate? Are we truly compassionate? Are we empathetic? Do we see ourselves as empathetic? Are we really empathetic? And so forth. These are just the types of questions that we put to ourselves when we do this identity work. And then eventually, of course, the highest type of work there is to see completely through that identity and yet continue using it as a tool for the well-being of the world. We see how it's how it does not in, exist inherently through insight practices. That's where the insight practice in Buddhism comes uh, forth very powerfully. And at the same time, we then say, oh, but it is a useful tool. It's just a construct. It does not exist in anything but the name alone, but it's a useful construct that can be used to contribute to the well-being of the world, for example, regardless of what our unique combination of these identities is. So this is where we can orient the energy of identity towards this 
cessation, the third point there, the cessation of this unnecessary suffering. But then with regards to thinking and feeling, the Buddha, of course, has identified a very, very important element there, a very, very important dynamic. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is one of the most prominent translators from Pali, uh, one of the most respected Western monastics in the Theravada tradition, and one of the most important socially engaged Buddhists as well, is many initiative that, that he is part of and is quite outspoken or incredibly outspoken on issues of social justice and environmental justice and food related justice and so forth. Is a wonderful essay in one of the two books that I will mention in, in a few moments. And in that essay, he applies Buddha's thinking about the so-called three fires to the environmental problems that we're seeing are, uh, are around. And this comes from the so-called fire sermon by the Buddha. It's a teaching about how the world is being consumed by suffering because of the fires of ignorance, greed, and malice. So the three poisons uh, more frequently in the Tibetan tradition referred to as ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And of course, learning about what those three mean is a whole and large and powerful undertaking. I know that um, um, the Dharma Collective has recently hosted Venerable Rabina Kurtin, who's one of my teachers, who's incredibly skillful in describing what is it that Buddha calls attachment here, because it's very different from the psychological understanding of attachment, for example, within attachment theory, where we talk about different attachment styles and so forth. It's a very different concept. But simplified version of that would simply call that greed. And this is where, once again, we can stop. And I remember us mentioning this point in my one time uh, in person at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, because we were talking about ethics, applied ethics, or we were discussing the Dalai Lama's book, Beyond Religion. And we took a moment to consider how many of our problematic decisions are related to greed. And how many problematic decisions in the world at large are related to greed? So this is where we can once again think, even things that we think are actually about malice, like wars, are they not at the deeper level driven by greed? At the deepest level, everything is driven by ignorance, of course, the absence of common sense, of common sense that would understand the interdependence, the causality, how causes bring results and all of that and how parts affect the whole how another part how someone else's well-being affects our own well-being all of those types of wisdom yes it's their absence that makes us do all those sorts of things but the most immediate expression the most powerful expression of ignorance is sometimes said to be greed or attachment and it's this greed that perhaps makes people in the positions of power say no we will not meet the demands of the protesters. We will not meet the demands of the writers and the actors. We will not meet the demands of the environmentalists. We don't care. We just want that profit. And what's powerful and scary at the same time is that we all have the same tendency and we all also share a culture that encourages that tendency to a certain degree. So this is once again a moment of cultural analysis then. Then what can I do to counteract this, as Tony Bernhardt calls it, wanting monster, the want monster within me, so that I can control it to a greater degree. And how can then I contribute to a world that would be better at controlling the greed in our shared system? So how can I teach my children, if I have children, to be better at controlling their greed? How can I train my mentees to be better at controlling their greed? How can I make sure that the culture of my company is not built around greed, but is built around establishing greater well-being and bringing benefit while maybe still being financially reasonable? So interesting questions to consider. And so this meditation, this contemplation on the three fires and how they manifest in our own behavior and then literally manifest in this world as fires that are burning to crisp the great forests of the world, that's an interesting thing to explore at the global level. But then beyond that, what do we do? How do we counteract that? Well, once again, we return to the personal level and we establish certain degrees of stability there. We train in ethical discipline. 
and mental stability and we try to strengthen our wisdom becoming more and more and more reasonable about how we see causality and interdependence and so forth and we're also cultivating the qualities of love compassion and uh, all of those sorts of things through applied training and then eventually another important aspect and we have talked about this since the very first meeting as well is that we also try to develop a mental quality of appreciation towards this this world that we're trying to save because otherwise we kind of sort of lacking the object of our aspirations we're not really clear on what is it that we're trying to protect and why is that important? So once again, a quote from Karen Armstrong's wonderful book, Sacred Nature, which I very much recommend. We cannot save our planet unless we undergo a radical change of mind and heart, which will inevitably be demanding. This transformation cannot take place overnight. We too have to learn to see the things of nature with reverence, and this will require sustained effort, an authentic change of heart, discipline, and commitment. And I would add a change of culture, because let, losing the understanding that the earth is on the material level at least the most valuable thing that we have and that understanding being deliberately replaced by these dreams of going to mars from a person who just spent 44 billion dollars buying a social media platform and running it to the ground that's quite unreasonable so instead thinking okay this planet is what we have we're intricately bound to it in terms of our energetic systems, in terms of our DNA, in many, many, many ways. We are sort of like hairs on its skin. And we can either be protecting it, or we can be seen as like cancerous cells that are actually trying to destroy the planet. And so developing that powerful reverence, and there are many ways to do that through many different types of perception, seeing it as a beautiful expression of the four elements or uh, five elements or following Thich Nhat Hanh's beautiful quote about how earth is the greatest of the bodhisattvas, the most beautiful of the bodhisattvas and so forth. Many different ways of considering it from a Christian perspective, from a Muslim perspective. That's what Karim Armstrong actually does an overview of in the book, offering us multiple perspectives. Each one of us would work to establish that sense of sacredness of this thing that we're trying to protect or being that we're trying to protect or deity that we're trying to protect depending on how we want to see it or a system that we're trying to protect and then with it trying to find some solutions so uh, two questions to contemplate here that i like to uh, raise the first one is do i have a feeling that nature in general is sacred important beautiful and i would add how can i strengthen that feeling so this is what Karen Armstrong's book is about. But beyond that, uh, the book is just, of course, um, a helpful guide on the path. It's not the cause of that feeling. The greatest feeling arises when we do come into the contact with the earth directly. And that can happen through our contact with any environment that is inspiring and beautiful to us personally. So I know people who are incredibly awed by seeing majestic mountains and i have i know people who are awed by seeing an ocean in front of them of them you know people who are awed by simply seeing a, a tree or a flower it can be anything but it's an access point to that larger energetic domain and until we invest some hours into that and in our first meeting we described an exercise that can help us with that it will be difficult to have that sense of sacredness and importance and reverence and beauty present within our mind constantly or consistently so once again it's like a, we have a long list of things to do to become an ecodharma practitioner and that's one of the points on the list develop the mental factor the mental function of appreciation with regards to the planet buddhist psychology talks a lot about this mental factor it is actually the mental function that so often gets translated as devotion but uh, mugu uh, sorry, Mopa. Uh, Mugu is a combination of uh, this rev or this appreciation and uh, uh, respect. But the root of appreciation, Mopa, is sometimes translated in devo as devotion, but what it actually means is an ability to appreciate something and see it as truly valuable. And it said that it's this mental factor of Mopa, when it's present in our mind, that allows all that inspiration from the different lineages to flow into our heart. And unless we have that appreciation, 
our, our heart is dead. There's nothing to receive that inspiring energy. So we might be visiting the greatest spiritual place in the world. We might be in an incredible place of pilgrimage that is fully vibrant with the prayers and the practices and the blessings of the previous generations. Or we might be in the most beautiful natural environment in the world, something that no one has ever seen it that is so incredibly beautiful. But unless there is that mental factor from our side, unless there's that mental state present within our mind, unless it's active, and it will only be active if we're either gifted with it or we have taken the time to cultivate it. Unless that's there, nothing will click. There will not be a moment of awe. There will not be a moment of transformation. And uh, this is where I also would uh, invite everyone to uh, go to the Greater Good website. Many people know that our dear friend, uh, Dr. Evekman has worked with uh, the Greater Good uh, Science Center for many years and look up uh, some of the benefits of awe uh, for our mental well-being and mental health, how important actually it is to feel awe for our mental well-being. It's a very fascinating exploration uh, coming from multiple sources and multiple researchers. Um, and then the second question, this is very practical. So we've discussed all of this, we've considered all of it, and let's say we've done all these practices that we have just talked about, connecting to nature, developing a sense of appreciation, cultivating the love and kindness and compassion, and uh, trying to pump all of that into the systems that we belong to. We have cultivated certain mental stability, observed our breath, found our emotions about, uh, found out what our emotions are about all of this stuff. So then what do we do in a practical level as our first step, perhaps, if we're not actively engaged in activism yet. I think one good solution is to, first of all, think, uh, ask ourselves, is there a specific natural phenomenon or place that I have special feelings about, locally or globally? Something that I feel tender about, that I especially like. One way to go about this is to ask ourselves, which of the five elements do I feel most close to? Or let's say four, let's emit space for now and just think about water, fire, you know, earth, air. Am I passionate about water? Well, if that's what I find out, that uh, then I might explore the initiatives about protecting the waters. And uh, we know that there are incredibly difficult struggles around that happening in many places, including North America, where indigenous tribes are trying to protect the purity of rivers and lakes and so forth. And there's incredible opposition from oil rigging companies. Uh, but there are also much simpler initiatives of making sure a specific lake or pond is clean and clear or ensuring the quality of water, making sure there's no problems with the sewage systems that are might potentially pollute uh, the environment and so forth. So water related stuff, or the same with air or the same with earth. And that can be broken down into soil so earth proper and for example the world of trees which is something more elusive or if we're passionate about fire how about we focus on the renewable energy coming from the sun so solar power related initiatives and there's already so many things that even an individual can do starting with educating ourselves and changing the culture about that and then potentially contributing to different initiatives around solar panels you know so that's one way of thinking about it. But if we don't want to think about the five elements, we can think about specific local places. Is there a forest that you really love? Mm -hmm. Or an area, or a region, or a mountain? And literally almost every geographical object, natural object that we might think of, would be facing danger. And quite often, there would be people already trying to protect it. And if not, we might become the first people to do that. Uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a huge thing where um, the government of a specific region in Russia uh, was trying to start digging a sacred, sacred mountain uh, in order to excavate things that are needed to produce baking soda. And there was an incredible inflow of people from that region trying to protect that, and they were staying on the mountain for many days and actively fighting the excavators that were coming and eventually they succeeded to a certain degree and uh uh even though that 
didn't help the country in general, but in a specific way, that specific object was protected. It was a triumph for at least the time being. And this is one thing where we can similarly think, oh, well, if is there a hill or a mountain of that nature that I care about? So that's another thing to start with. And uh, we just consider that and then we think, okay, this is where I might start my learning and then contributing. So first I learn about this issue, water, justice, and so forth. Then I can start aspiring. Hmm. May I contribute to this field? And then we actually start doing something, even if it's simply spreading the awareness by using whatever platform we have. That's already quite something, changing the culture. And then that's where we can exercise our ability to use the four powers of pacifying and so forth. But this is where also we can very briefly think of the six perfections of a bodhisattva, for example, and that's six qualities that we definitely need on the eco-dharma path. So let's just do a very brief um, reflection, sort of an informal meditation. And of course, if you want, it's perfectly fine to once again adopt a comfortable stationary position. It will not be long, but it will allow us to explore this question on a deeper level within a more relaxed and stable state. So just allowing our body to rest, allowing our mind to notice the sensations associated with our contact to the ground, with our breathing. And with our body and mind resting, we can either think about the domain of environmentalism in general, or identify a specific element or object, natural object that we're passionate about, or a specific initiative. And then we can ask ourselves, in this domain, how can I practice generosity? How can I be generous with my time or my money or my attention or the material objects that I possess or the skills that I possess? In the foreseeable future, how can I be generous? How can I practice ethical discipline? Meaning, how can I, with regards to this specific domain, avoid harming, actively work to bring benefit, and cultivate the resources of my heart and mind? How can I practice patience by keeping my mind equanimous, not succumbing to blinding rage or despair for that matter? How can I keep my mind balanced and resourced? How can I practice joyous effort? 
becoming enthusiastic about something beneficial or wholesome that I can do. How can I practice concentration by strengthening my attention skills and applying them appropriately? Having a disciplined, focused mind in this domain. And finally, how can I practice wisdom in this domain by looking at the problems, the issues, the solutions in a way that would strengthen my understanding of interdependence or interbeing? So with that, once again, we can seal this contemplation by revisiting the aspiration we generated in the beginning, such as may I always contribute to the healing of the world or bring greater harmony to the world or benefit all beings. And then coming back to the space around us and to our shared space for the final observations for today. So indeed, the final observations, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, the six perfections or the six far-reaching practices um, or the six practices going beyond, that's another way of translating the Tibetan Parolto Chimpa, uh, Paramita in Sanskrit, are generosity, ethical discipline, patience, enthusiastic effort, concentration, and wisdom. And these are the six qualities that a bodhisattva needs to cultivate and perfect uh, on the path to full awakening. And also, incidentally, six qualities that could be quite elegantly integrated into any beneficial activity whatsoever, including our environmentalism, if we're interested in that, but also equally any type of acti activism that we might be doing in this world, any positive activity whatsoever. Every session of meditation actually is sometimes described as needing to include all six because we're generous with uh, material resources in the space that we meditate on, uh, meditate in, we practice discipline by sitting down and uh, meditating for a specific amount of time. We're patient, patient with the challenges that are arising. We're enthusiastic about the effort that we're applying, trying to feel some joy in the process of practice. And of course, we're concentrating and are trying to be wise as well. So a similar application is possible with everything environmental that we're doing. And to be quite honest, even if we don't want to think too much about, oh, what is it that I can do in the world around me with regards to the elements or the specific natural objects or other types of initiatives, here's a very simple advice from Chikunir Rinpoche, who's one of my primary spiritual mentors. We should simply 
aspire to plant 25,000 plants in this world. So maybe even that, you know, we can plant them ourselves, we can sponsor some planting, we can plant them in different parts of the world through many initiatives that exist around this, but we can also plant basil in our kitchen. And slowly, slowly, just by aspiring to this great number, even if we would never get to it, we are making a contribution to the greenery of the world, which is incredibly important. And if we can somehow contribute to greener cities, which would actually have a huge regulating effect on the levels of heat and um, the unbearable heat in many cases uh, in the biggest cities of the world, that would also be incredible. And because we're all coming from different platforms, we all have different ways of reaching uh, people and affecting the in global interdependence, maybe even that. So that's the goal. Let's consider planting 25,000 plants. But then the question is always, so how do I do that most skillfully? How do I plant the plants that are, if I'm planting outside, that are good for this natural environment that would not damage the ecosystem and its fragile balance? How do I uh, plant the seeds that, for example, come from indigenous lineages and are still preserved as opposed to the seeds that are owned by the great corporations of this world and that would simply once again reinforce their agenda as opposed to the agenda of the natural world itself yada 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 many things to contemplate here but at the end of the day whatever we do it's also important to congratulate ourselves on what we have been able to do and find joy in both our effort and in the aspirations that lie at the root of that effort and uh, in an attempt to continue uh, exploring this, uh, uh, all of this, and I, as you can see, I have many more slides to con uh, to explore. I would recommend these two books. Uh, the one on the left by Solness the Dal Lamaco, a third by Franz Alt, is just a general uh, invitation to consider the importance of the natural world uh, with regards to how the Buddha saw it, for example, and so forth. But the one on the right, True Peace Work, published actually in the Bay Area, I believe, is a wonderful collection of essays from many people, including the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, John and Macy, and many other very important names that would be familiar to people who are interested in this domain. And this wonderful collection would give us lots of food for contemplation and lots of suggestions for practice. And that's a very good beginning to uh, explore. I've been very grateful for this opportunity to connect to all of you and also my deep vows of gratitude to everyone who is connected to the cycle by means of a recording as well. Deep bows of gratitude to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, to Noam and to Cage personally for inviting me. And um, just as a final note, may we indeed contribute to the healing of the world at all times. So thank you very much. Wishing you a beautiful Sunday and hoping to reconnect at a later date so that we continue, uh, continue exploring all these themes together. Thank you. <laughs>